This is where business ideas and passions turn into profit. Whether you're dreaming of becoming your own boss, but don't know how to get started, or have already started a side hustle and wish to grow it exponentially, your host, Victoria Wick, can help you turn your passion-based business ideas into profit. Welcome to Million Dollar Passion. Here is your host, world-renowned jewelry designer and home shopping TV celebrity, Victoria Wick. Welcome to another episode of the Million Dollar Hobbies podcast. Week after week, we bring you amazing guests, amazing stories, amazing business ideas. And this week is no exception. I have um, Alex Sanfilippo, who actually started the uh, Pod Match. It's the service that I use uh, quite often, actually, uh, to bring you to find you these amazing guests. And um, I actually, st- you know, on- only discovered Pod Match uh, very recently. But once I started it, I kind of got addicted to it. And um, I'm just like so excited to be interviewing Alex because as um, crazy as it sounds, he's, you know, he's built a whole platform, but his backstory, how he, you know, came about creating Podmatch and all that, I think you're, you're going to find that really interesting, informative, and encouraging. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Alex. Alex, welcome to the show. Victoria, thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Hey, so um, here in your bio, uh, this is something I didn't actually uh, think about before. You started your business at age 10. So obviously, the entrepreneurship uh, sort of um, desires or entrepreneurship you know, blood kind of runs through your veins. Right. So tell me a little bit about um, just a, a quick, you know, three, four minutes of your backstory, because a lot of times what you what you do in your childhood, uh, your your early years kind of shape what you do later on in life. So tell yeah. me, you want to share a little bit about you? Definitely. And I, I completely agree with that statement. Actually, at one point in my life, I did some reflecting back to my childhood to, to, to rediscover who I was, which maybe we'll get into, maybe not. But I think that's an important practice for, for anybody to do. But uh, for me, yeah, 10 years old, and most people hear that, like, what, what on earth was this guy doing at 10? I was selling used golf balls in across the street. We live uh, from, a, there was a golf course that, that were the house I grew up in. And that, what I did is I just started collecting golf balls and selling them. It was interesting, though, because at 10 years old, I was a very self-aware child, which maybe is kind of strange for a 10-year-old. But I remember I had three younger brothers, and we had just a bunch of neighborhood friends. And a lot of them were really good at sports. And others were really good at school. They're very smart. Some were, most of them were good at video games at that point. So all these different kids were good at these different things. And I just realized that I wasn't really good at those things. And it didn't necessarily depress me. It just made me wonder where I fit in. And I know that's super weird for a 10-year-old kid to be that self-aware maybe, but that's really how I felt. And the first time I picked up a golf ball and a golfer offered to buy it from me for $3, it was a Titleist Pro V1, which apparently is like the, the expensive ball. Um, I'm not a golfer myself. I know how to sell used golf balls as a kid. But um, as soon as I did that, I realized that, oh, maybe I should find more of these. And what I realized I enjoyed wasn't even making the money. It was the art of building some sort of system that drives a profit. So I started recruiting my brothers and some of the friends on the neighborhood saying, hey, let's let's go through the lakes. Let's get some guys to clean the golf balls. Let's get some to organize them into different bins. And then let's set up a time and day that we can sell these things back to the golfers. And uh, so that's what I did for a couple of years from 10 to 12. But I'll tell you what, for the first time in my life, and I know I was very young, I really discovered something that I was actually good at. And it was the art of business. So, you know, uh, in that just a quick uh, 10 year old mind uh, mind uh, you actually were doing what uh, not, uh, what a modern entrepreneur has to do now which is find the product that has that's in demand right figure out the price uh, find a bunch of people that's going to help you so you were kind of like a little boss of that little <laughs> thing that was going on. You were the CEO of the 10 year old crowds, right? That's actually really astonishing. Um, and you know, Alex, I think it's really, um, and I'm going to digress for just a little bit, uh, but that, you know, in our schools, unfortunately, uh, we teach math, we teach science, you know, we teach all these things that have numbers and uh, we don't really teach entrepreneurship or relationship uh, to money. Uh, you know, and finances and how, you know, how much you have to actually work to to buy something. And I think um, I wish that more people, somebody would actually kind of, you know, go ahead and teach that in school. So now fast forward a little bit. So you obviously, you know, once you're a 10 year old child and you're, you know, selling uh, Tyler's Pro V for five, 
three dollars, for example. I mean, three dollars to a ten-year-old kid is a lot of money. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, three bucks would be like you know, hey, like you know, you're going to Disneyland. So, <laughs> uh, so once you get once you get a little taste of that, you uh, obviously you want to multiply that. So you then found different systems, you know, in in your life. So the, tell us what happened after that. What was your second venture? Yeah. So obviously you can only sell golf balls that are used back to the golfers that hit them in the lakes for so long until you're not cute anymore. And they just want to punch you for taking their golf ball to the lake. <laughs> um, so from about 10 to 12, that I was doing that. And actually the truth is some guy came through on, on his, uh, on his golf cart. He liked the collection of golf balls we had so much. He said he'd buy them all if we would just go ahead and close down. And so he, I think at that point we must have had six or 700 golf balls. And at the end of the day, sure enough, he finished his round of golf. He came, picked them all up and he paid me and the neighborhood guys for him. So at that point, we're just like, you know what? I think it's a good time to stop. We're done. And uh, so from then I I just, (laughs) that was your exit. (laughs) That was my exit. Yes. That was my first and only successful exit. But um, (laughs) anyway, uh, at that point, I, uh, I was obviously getting into high school or I I guess was that late middle school. I don't even remember. It was a long time ago, but I was getting through that. And as I got into my late teens, I had an opportunity to do some work in real estate because I was good on a computer. Again, I wasn't good at video games, but I was good on a computer. And there was a friend of my dad's who was starting a company where they were trying to create these virtual tours of homes, which now we all see them. Like you, you look at a, a home on Zillow or something like that. You can drag the mouse around and see the roof and the whole room. Well, we were building those tours. So he brought me on as, as a contractor saying, hey, let's work together. So I had my company, he had his, and I started hiring photographers and editors. And we started actually building these virtual tours for the MLS directly. So we were actually posting on the MLS every single day because it became in high demand really fast. So that was a really fun thing for me at, at a, I guess, I was 17 when I started that. It was really cool because I look at it now. I also had a remote team. None of us worked in an office. Like everyone worked out of their own places. And we were using back then AIM, AIM, uh, to instant message back and forth. That's how we were communicating throughout the day. But that was a really, another really fun experience for me to really learn business and to see how something could run and operate and grow. And at this point, I was also paying taxes, by the way. <laughs> so you know what? Alex, that's really amazing. So at 10 years old, you started your company, you had a successful exit. Then at about 17, in your late teens, you know, what I find really uh, astonishing about the whole story that you told is this, um, you know, the MLS having the virtual tours and all of that. I mean, today we take it for granted. In fact, I just mm-hmm. sold my home in Las Vegas, you know, that is uh, it's a very substantial price. And the person never saw it. I mean, they they felt comfortable enough. I mean, they were able to go up to the roof and, you know, do all that and be able to kind of see the whole house without actually being there. So, you know, in COVID, they couldn't travel. So they basically, you know, bought the house upside uh, unseen. But when you did it, um, that technology the idea of touring a home at any price, you know, $200,000, $300,000, a million dollars, that would be unthinkable. But you did it because you believed in it and you felt that the the world was going to have to go that way at some point. Mm -hmm. So you had a pulse on what was going on and you were just a few steps ahead of the rest of the world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's really important because I think, you know, that, now I'm going to fast forward a little bit more because you've done other things in between, which we're going to skip over now, because compared to what you're doing now, which I'm really excited about, uh, and I told you I'm an avid user of Podbatch, is that you created a, now a platform for podcasters. And I have to tell you, podcasting industry is exploding. Mm-hmm. I mean, back in 1998, when I first went to HSN, um, you know, when, they, when HSN first called me, and they said, you know, we're the home shopping network. I was like, you're, you're what? Uh, and, they <laughs> me, and I was like, is that like some kind of a club? Um, I had no clue what was going on. But when they showed me what they did, you know, and I also thought that, you know, because remember at that in 98, um, they had like a 1-800 number, like a catalogs. And mm-hmm. I thought that would be the next revolution. Now here with you, the po- you know, podcasting is exploding. It, it makes complete sense that, you know, people, are, it, it, there are more people at home listening, you know, we all want to educate ourselves. It's only like a 20 minute investment. Everything's free out there. Like most podcasts are free to listen to. So it's exploding. And you found a way to have, you, you saw a need. If you're going to be a successful podcaster, it's, it, it takes enormous amount of time to find the right guest for your show. I mean, I could, 
you know, there's a lot of, I know a lot of famous people, but they're not necessarily right for my show. So, cause my show is about transformation stories. So a lot of times, you know, it's lesser known people that's done some extraordinary things. Um, and you created a platform. So people like us can go find somebody easily at the, at, you know, at my fingertips at night, you know, after everybody gone, it's gone to bed and um, I can do this in 20 minutes of time at a time. So you created this uh, platform. Um, so tell me a little bit about how, how and why you created all of this and how long did it take for you to, you to do this? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And thank you for the, for being a, a member of Podmatch and just, I mean, I mean, you're, you're a great supporter. Like I, my day has been made just talking to you today. So thank you, Victoria. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, yeah. So too, by the way, it's 39 bucks. I mean, it's, it's basically free, you know, <laughs> Listen, if you and I went out to lunch and we skipped the, the, you know, the fancy drink, everything you and I both got iced tea where I, I live. It'd be, you know, with tip, it'd be 39 bucks. Right. And you know, I wish everyone felt that same way, Victoria, honestly, but I, I appreciate that. And you saying that I'm going to, I'm going to quote that part. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I, I got into podcasting a couple of years before I started Podmatch. So me as an individual, like my, my own show. And because I, I saw that that was a, an industry that was really taking off. Like I, I didn't do it so I could become famous or anything like that. I just wanted to have conversations with people and record it somehow. And my background before that I did a bit of blogging, and as much as I love blogging, it didn't capture the same essence. When you do like a, a written interview back and forth, it's definitely not the same. So I was like, you know what? This audio platform has been great for me. I've been listening for years, like while I'm in the gym or while I'm running, I listen to podcasts. So I decided, you know what? I want to start my own show. And right when I started, Victoria, I noticed something really interesting. People that are in podcasting are very kind. Like a lot of other show hosts that I meet, they're just so nice. And that made me want to get even more into the industry. So when I just saw it starting to take off, that's when I made a decision that, you know what, I'm going to do anything I can to support this industry. It's going to grow. If there was a business started in here, it's not going to crash in a year or two. Like someday podcasting might be a thing of the past, but right now it's still on the up and up. And I just made it a devotion at that point to find something that I could do to help the industry. And the way I did it, just like a really simple framework is again, I'm passionate about podcasting. So I found the people that made up the ecosystem of it. So the host, I just asked them, Hey, what are you struggling with? And like you said, Victoria, it can be tough going and looking for guests when you're not sure if people even want to be on shows. Like, yeah, we've all got a cousin or a friend that started a business that could, could jump on our shows maybe, but finding those people who really are saying, I'm looking for shows. I have a message that will really re resonate well with your listeners. That's not easy to find. So I just identified that problem and decided to create a solution for it. And that's, that's where Podmatch came from. Well, that's really great. So again, you, it's just like your golf ball story, you found a need, you found something that could be in high demand and you found the friction point um, and basically, you know, made it really simple for me. I love Podma Podmatch because it is so simple and the diversity of the people that are there at the shows as well as, and I agree with you on the, uh, the, the caliber of people within the podcast industry, because the TV industry is completely different. TV industry hmm. is so catty. It is really, oh God, uh, you know, it's just, it is just probably the most cutthroat business you'll find. You know, people always ask me like, how do you ever survive uh, TV, you know? 20 years of TV because you almost like either not have to have a, a pulse or you have to be so numb when you don't see anything. Then when I got into pod, pod match, I mean, podcasting, people were just so nice. They were offering me like, you know, all, everything, like my microphone, all this, it was all set up by people that didn't charge me a penny. You know, they gave me, they gave me their heart and soul. Like, you know, you ought to, you know, you understand video, but you know, in audio, you got to do this and that. I mean, everything was free. And um, I just love that. I love that community of people that just really give it their all. And um, the other thing about the, the, the podcasting platform is that it's true that video has a lot more impact, but, you know, I don't have time to like, you know, if I was watching a YouTube video, I can't be driving. Like if I'm driving right. to San, San Diego, that's two hours that I have, you know, I can listen to four different podcasts. Okay. But I can't watch a single video because, you know, you get, get into a car accident if you are watching that. So I think that platform is great. Now, as far as, um, you know, creating this platform, was it like, without giving away your proprietary secrets, was it like really hard to come up with a technology piece uh, you know, because you got the technology piece in terms of, you know, how the software works behind the scenes. And then you got to go find all these podcasts, podcasters. Then you have to find all the potential guests, like, you know, all these other pieces have to come in. How how difficult was that to kind of 
coordinate all that? And how much time did it take? I mean, is it two years, two months, 20 years? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Like the timing is so, you know this, Victoria, the timing in business is so important. Yeah. And, and it's, it's really, I mean, it's the number one factor. If you ask uh, Bill Gross, uh, he's like the unicorn billionaire. I guess he's, he started like seven multi-billion dollar companies or something like that. Like, and he says that timing is the most important factor. We just happen to be at the right time is what I'm going to say first. I'm, I'm not saying we couldn't do it again, but when we started, I say we, because I have a co-founder. So for me, I am more on the sales side of things. I'm customer service. I, I can build systems and I understand like how the, the industry works. I have a friend that is someone that I knew for years and he and I had always planned on working together at some point. As a matter of fact, we did one other project together years prior and it was really cool. We had good synergy. And so when I had this idea, it was actually right after PodFest 2020. It was like the last in-person conference ever. And uh, I spoke at that conference and that's where I got the idea for it, right? I identified the problem and I said, I'm going to build a solution for us. I came home that next week and on March 10th, 2020, I wrote it out. I have three whiteboards behind me, behind the screen that's behind me right now. And I just wrote it all out in three whiteboards. And then I immediately picked up my phone and called that friend and said, hey, Jesse, I don't know if you have capacity to, to, to work part-time on a project, but I'd love to, to do something with you. And he said that it was crazy. That was like a Tuesday, I think. And that Sunday night, he just finished like a multi-year project that he'd been working on. And he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've got capacity. So what we did is we just draft up documentation saying we're 50-50 partners and decided to run with it. So March 10th, 2020 is when we started working on it. And we launched an early beta on June 10th, 2020. So just a few short months from start to finish. Now he is brilliant. He was able to obviously save us a lot of money by doing that. We bootstrapped it with five thousand dollars. Each of us put twenty five hundred into account, and we just went for it. Well, you know what? I wish you and um, your friend Jesse all the luck in the world. Thank and you. Let me give you some encouragement. I, not not like you really need it, but I was at a um, a Harvard uh, Business School uh, reunion, um, like. And Harvard Business School, basically, they make you go back to class, you know, once you've been there all that time. And they had a panel of people, um, you know, graduates that's been out of school for years and years and years. And they talked about what are your challenges and so forth. And they had a guy from Google, a Harvard alumni from, you know, Google, Apple, uh, Facebook, and, you know, uh, all these different companies that are now running our world or seemingly. And they asked them, uh, what are you, uh, what keeps you up at night? And <laughs> the answer was that we all work for a, a founder that started their company with under $5,000 in their garage. Hmm. I mean, I, I didn't think about it that way, but it's true. Apple started with, you know, less than 5,000 as well. So you guys fit that bill. Exactly. <laughs> right. That's nice. That's good to know. That encouragement goes a long way. Thank you. I, I just thought that, that you might find that really, that, you know, comparison very, very, you know, timely and well. Uh, when it comes to, you know, how you and Jesse and how the, the, you know, you feel like you were at the right place at the right time. I also feel that way a lot of times about my uh, little successes. You know, every time I hit a milestone, I would think, gee, I really lucked out. But I like to also believe that it's a preparation meeting opportunity because we're all here at the same time at the same place, but you guys thought about you guys had the, the ideas and all, you know, all there, not all of us had, you know, we were all at the same time at the same place. So you took action on that. So it could be divine alignment of some sort or um, preparation meeting, you know, opportunities. So, you know, kudos to you um, and Jesse. Um, my question to you as we close is um, I know that you've created a brand called creating a brand, which is now being um, you, you wanted to simplify this. And uh, you wanted to make it simple. And I love that. You really are a customer-centric company, uh, much like how, that's how Amazon grew. You know, they made this very simple for their customers. So you are now rebranding it to PodPros, right? So PodPros.com. And um, so what's next for PodMatch and PodPros? Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Thank you for, you're the first person to ever announce that company name. Like I've not, I've never said it to anyone other than you, Victoria. So thank you for being the person to, to say it. <laughs> yeah, breaking news. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, for me, th there's something that I, I want to mention there real quick. And it's, it goes back to something that Leonardo da Vinci said. And he said that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And I think it's something that so many of us need to remember because yes, it, Podmatch is a complex system. If you looked at the back end code, it, like me, it'd make my head explode, like seeing all that. But in the day, <laughs> We, we had one problem to solve, which is can we get the right guest in front of the right host and vice versa? 
At the end of the day, could we simply do that and then just continuously improve that process to make it faster, more streamlined? And so for me, like I look at the different things I'm doing right now, like I had to have a real like come to Jesus moment is what I call it. So like for me, it was actually time in prayer. Like, God, I'm doing too much right now. Like I've got my podcast. I've got I've got uh, now I have um, um, podcast SOP and Podmatch, these other companies that we're, we're reaching out and starting. And, I, you know, like when I did that deep self-reflection, I realized that, you know what, this is going to get complicated and cumbersome for other people to try to understand what I even do. And that's why we decided to rebrand under Pod Pro. So the idea was, again, bring it back to a simplistic form. What's adding the most value to the people that we care about the most? And let's just focus on that one thing. And so what's next for us is, I just mentioned it, Podcast SOP is a new company that we're launching. And it's project management software specifically for podcasters. A lot of new ones, they're using sticky notes. They're using Word documents. Like they're, they're trying to keep it organized. We wanted to do it to help people do that easily because... And Victoria, you know, I feel the same way about this. We believe that podcasting is a great medium for people to get their their independent voices out there. And unfortunately, 90% of podcasts don't make it past their first year. It's only 10% that make it. So I wanted to help see more people through that first year so they can continue adding that value to people's lives. So really, that's our big focus is can we continue helping more and more podcasters get their message out there to the world? I completely agree with you. In fact, I think I'm one of the 50 people that the beta testing people that you've. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, the, you know, before Podmatch, I was using like four or five different softwares, you know, you're using, um, you know, scheduling software, you're using like organization software, all of the bios, it, it's just like a whole amount of work. So by simplifying that, I think that makes, you know, again, because a lot of podcasters start out as a side hustle, you know, they don't start out as monetizing it. Most podcasters start out because they're passionate about something and they want to help people. And like you said, a lot of them don't make 90% of them don't make it. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm with you on that. I, you know, I'd like to see that percentage go higher. I mean, but if you think about it, 90% is almost the same as any other small business, you know, it takes, yeah, you're uh, right. It takes small, you know, it takes a lot of discipline and, you know, understanding the basics, you know, who's your target audience and all that stuff as well. Uh, so I just want to, um, you know, close by asking you what for You've been in the industry for a while, and you are also seeing the uh, the pitfall, some of the mistakes that podcasters make. Now, going back to what Leonardo da Vinci said about simplicity being the ultimate sophistication, um, I agree with that. But I also want to tell you one thing. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is Winston Churchill's, uh, which he said something to the effect that success is not final and failure is not fatal. And a lot of people think that failure is not fatal is what they focus on. Uh, I like to think about success is not final because you had a very successful platform. Um, you know, there was nothing like Podmatch uh, a year ago, okay? But you continue to evolve because success is not final. You see, a lot of times when people are successful, they're so busy protecting that success or using that success to, you know, live their life or whatever they want to live that they forget to evolve. And, but... I, one thing I noticed about Podmatch, every time, almost every time I, you know, I'm on vacation or something, I come back and I shut my brain off for a little bit. Mm-hmm. You've improved the site again and again and again. You know, everything from visual to how it operates to how we upload our bios to how we link our calendar. I mean, you've just since I became a Podmatch member, like in maybe April or May, you've gone through many different upgrades already. So I, you know, kudos to you there as well. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's been something that we wanted to always do. So we asked the members that use it, like what works, what doesn't. We let them help us with the roadmap. But the idea is really to focus on that continuous improvement. And the, the way that like we keep this in our minds is we, Jeff, Jeff Bezos kind of made this famous. I know he didn't come up with it, but his whole concept is it's always day one. We can't right. ever let people decide. We can't ever decide internally, like we've made it, we've arrived, it's day two. It's always day one, which means we're always on the ground floor just now getting started. Right. And that's always the mentality that we're going to keep. It's opening day, you know? Yep. Um, so what is your advice to a brand new podcast or starting out facing that 90% failure rate? Yeah, I think the very first thing you have to do is really develop a really strong why for yourself. Like, why are you podcasting? And if it's something like, well, I want to make money or I want a thousand or 10 million downloads or whatever it might be, those reasons might be a little bit too shallow and they're not bad. Like they can be part of it, but really you need to begin with who are you serving? Like who's going to be that person listening? And that comes in form of identifying what I just call an avatar. So your most ideal listener and come up with one person. You say, you know what? This person 
they're not a real person, but that somebody, this is who would listen and anybody like them and develop a strong why around that. And then what I recommend doing is like, if you have unspecific goals, you're going to have unspecific results. And that's always been true. So if it's day one, you're starting and you've determined that why, decide what you want the avatar to have learned in 12 months from now. So think 365 days in advance. Let's say they're with you from day one till then. Where do you want them to have gone on their journey as a direct result of listening to you? And I think that if you continuously have that mindset of I'm doing this for that ideal listener and you find that narrow niche to really focus in, I believe that you're going to do really well in podcasting. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you on that. So, Alex, how uh, if people want to find you other than podpros.com, uh, is there any other place that they can connect you with? I know. Thankful. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do all your social media links, too. But yeah, yeah, thankfully, that's now it. If you would have asked me this two weeks ago, I would have given you four different websites. But you see how we're simplifying. But uh, I, I do want to quickly say, Victoria, I commend you for how organized you are. Another thing that really helps podcasters organization, you are the most organized podcast host I've ever had the opportunity to be a guest with. And also you do a great job of the show. I'm a listener myself. You had a recent episode with Nathan Byam, I think is his name about how to build a website to test your products. Brilliant conversation. I recommend the listeners go check that one if they haven't heard it, but I just really appreciate you having me here and what you're doing with the show. Well, thank you so much and uh, good luck to you. And if you ever need, you know, um, feedback from some of us podcasters, you know, just make sure to reach out to me. I've got a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got very valid feedback. So I appreciate it, Victoria. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And uh, for thank you again for listening for this week's podcast. And um, if you haven't rated and reviewed my show, please go ahead and do so now. And until next week, um, you know, please stay happy, healthy. And uh, remember, I always say happiness is your choice. And I hope you make great choices and optimistic choices until next week. Thank you. You've been listening to Million Dollar Passion, where we turn dreams into reality and passion into profit. According to ancient Chinese proverb, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Congratulations on taking that first step today. For more information on how Victoria can help you turn your business idea into a million dollars and to download Victoria's free ebook on passion based business ideas, visit milliondollarpassion.com. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show on your favorite podcast player.